final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12093 in the name of Margaret Mitchell on chest, heart and stroke, Scotland's outstanding support for survivors. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and invite those members who wish to take part in the debate to please press the request to squeak buttons now. And if we have your full attention, then we'll begin. Margaret Mitchell, yeah. seven yeah. minutes please or thereby. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted to begin by welcoming the members of Coatbridge Young Stroke Survivors to the Chamber this evening. I had the pleasure of meeting with this inspirational group towards the end of last year. At this meeting, through listening to the members' accounts of what happened to them, I began to understand the varied issues associated with strokes which survivors face. I discovered, for example, that those who have had a stroke often then experience hidden conditions. These will be different for each individual, but tiredness, memory loss, a lack of ability to concentrate and communication difficulties are common. Given this, stroke survivors support groups such as the ones provided by the charity Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland, CHSS for short, play an immensely important role. These groups provide the opportunity for survivors to meet and it can then be a tremendous relief for a survivor to know they are not alone and that someone else understands how they feel and what they are experiencing. The charity also helps stroke survivors to understand and come to terms with new physical and other limitations which can be a product of the stroke. CHSS, community stroke groups, are self-managed, so though linked to CHSS, this allows them the flexibility to reflect local, local interests and diversity. These groups help their members to take part in activities in their local community. In fact, when I heard about all the Coke Bridge members' activities, including abseiling, I felt a definite couch potato by comparison. The charity's community stroke services are provided in partnership with the NHS, which in turn helps to establish a link between community services and speech, language and physiotherapy. It is absolutely essential that stroke survivors have access to these services as soon as possible after having a stroke. The CHSS, 110 different communica uh, communication support services across Scotland, can offer either one-to-one -one or group support, which helps rebuild survivors' communication skills, an often daunting and formidable task. Despite this, the sad and unpalatable truth is that adequate physiotherapy and speech therapy is, in far too many cases, not available and survivors talk of different levels of provision across health board areas. This anecdotal evidence was confirmed by an FOI request I lodged <coughs> with health boards and local authorities which revealed either different levels of provision or, more worryingly still, a complete inability to specify exactly what provision was available. Minister, surely this lack of adequate provision is something which could be tackled and should be tackled as a priority. It makes sense in terms of preventative spend, but the difference it can make to the quality of life to survivors, their spouses and families who lives, whose lives are also turned upside down is beyond measure. Here CHSS offers invaluable support to the family members who virtually overnight can find themselves cast in the new stressful and intense role of carers of stroke survivors. This is an aspect often overlooked, as I heard in graphic, compelling and deeply disturbing detail yesterday when I met with some South Lanarkshire carers stroke survivors. The common thread was the lack of support available from the social work department, especially if the stroke survivor was not hospitalised for any length of time and or they owned their own home. The same story was repeated about how the survivors and their carers were left to flounder, callously told to make the arrangements to source and commission the necessary adaptations which they then had to pay for to allow the survivor to live in the familiar and comforting sanctuary of their own home. 
This at a time when stress levels for these carers is off the scale, especially if they are not just coping with this new demanding role, but are also facing financial difficulties from loss of employment, which could mean their home has to be sold. At the same time, the hidden conditions such as extreme tiredness has a knock-on effect for survivors just attempting to do routine tasks such as accessing a large supermarket and being forced to park several hundred metres from the entrance. Walking the distance might be possible, but slow and laborious to the point of not being feasible, given the extreme tiredness and exhaustion that can often suddenly set in for stroke survivors. Imagine the, humili the humiliation, therefore, of a stroke survivor, blue badge applicant, who was asked to attend the Motherwell North Lanarkshire Council HQ for assessment. On presenting, he was met by an occupational therapist and told to follow her to her room. She then proceeded to set off at a pace round the circular lobby. The survivor protested he couldn't keep up and needed to rest. This was ignored and he soldiered on to find himself back where he started. Apparently, the assessment had been completed and he was <coughs> refused the blue badge. Now, I don't believe for a, a second any politician would condone this degrading treatment. And certainly, when I made the director aware of what had taken place, he was appalled and confirmed that a proper reassessment would be carried out. But the callousness and dehumanising behaviour on the part of some local government officials, including social workers, usually far down the chain of command, must be addressed and checks and balances put in place to ensure stroke victims get a fair hearing. On a more positive note, the awareness raising acronym FAST is designed to help the public recognise that someone may be having a stroke. The F stands for face. If one side of the face is drooping, then it's, possible, it's a possible symptom. A stands for arms, and the test to see is whether they can lift both their arms. S is for speech. If slurred then together with the above signs, <coughs> then T means time to call 999. Early treatment and recognition of a stroke occurring where blood supply to the part of the brain is being cut off is clearly crucial to minimising long-term damage. Yet too many of the survivors at CH uh, CHSS report that GPs are not picking up the signs that indicate a patient is either at risk of a stroke or having a minor stroke, which can lead to a more severe stroke. <coughs> so whilst the FAST campaign is excellent, much more needs to be done to train GPs to recognise other stroke symptoms which can include high cholesterol, high blood pressure and or diabetes. Presiding officer, to put the scale of the problem in perspective, in Scotland today, every 45 minutes, someone will have a stroke. It could be anyone at any time which is why the issues raised tonight in this debate are so important and, if addressed, could make a monumental difference to the lives of survivors and their carers who deserve this Parliament's support. I therefore look forward to the Minister's response. Many thanks. Now call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. A thank you, Presiding Officer. And Presiding Officer, I can start with an apology to yourself and to Margaret Mitchell and to the other members that I, I will have to leave uh, early uh, as I have a, another engagement. I'm grateful to Margaret Mitchell for bringing this debate to the Chamber. And as the convener of the cross party group on heart disease and stroke, I am very much aware of the, the story that Margaret Mitchell has presented to the Chamber uh, this evening. The Chest Heart Stroke Scotland are the co-secretariat for the cross-party group and often presiding officer. We hear of stories of survivors at the cross-party group, all with their own individual stories. But presiding officer, a lot has happened and a lot of good work is going on. And indeed, the cross-party group were uh, instrumental in taking forward the uh, stroke charter, first moved by um, Helen Eady, 
And, uh, and obviously, when Hena Lanidi uh, died, I, I undertook to, to take that charter forward with the subgroup uh, of the committee. A charter which has been supported um, by, by the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health, Alex Neil, uh, before uh, he, he moved over to his other portfolio. And during the time that this charter was being uh, put forward, presiding officer, it was more to do with acknowledging that intervention after a person has a stroke needs to be quick. It needs to be at the time uh, and at the location that the person requires this important rehabilitation. Because quick intervention could prevent the person's stroke becoming that bit worse. Margaret Mitchell gave us one or two stories there, um, which are too often, presiding officer, the stories that we've heard at the cross-party group. People being uh, wrongly assessed, and I use the term wrongly assessed for things like a blue badge, for instance, because the full impact of the stroke isn't taken into cognizance during that assessment. And this is the fault of the assessment process and not understanding the impact or the full impact that a stroke may have on an individual and certainly the, the ability of that individual to carry out maybe the, the tasks that they had undertaken before. In my previous work in the North East Day Sentry Services, I came across many people who had a, a, a visual impairment as a result of stroke. And to understand this uh, hemianopia that that incurs, um, it's very difficult initially for the patient and certainly their families and carers. But with the right support and the right understanding, the person can learn to live with that degree of sight loss as they understand it and become, they can adjust to that with the right, with the right instruction and support. But too often, we don't get the right information. We don't often get the right support at the time of need. And this is not just frustrating for the patient, the sufferer or the survivor, as we talk about, but for their families and friends. And Margaret Mitchell's absolutely right. It can have a devastating impact on a person's, not just mental health, but their ability perhaps to go back to employment, their ability to perhaps do simple tasks, perhaps just to go out on their own and come back feeling refreshed from maybe a walk, because quite often that initial walk that they used to enjoy for leisure is one that is arduous and tiring and gets to the point that they may not wish to do it anymore. Chest, heart and stroke with the peer support, the invaluable peer support that it gives is immeasurable because knowing that someone else has survived, knowing that someone else has adjusted Knowing that someone else has moved on is inspirational for many. But we need to be aware... To draw to a close, please. Yes, but we need to be aware that it's just not um, charities like Chess Heart and Stroke. We all have a responsibility, and that includes our general practitioners and our cl clinicians. So, once again, I thank Margaret Mitchell for bringing this debate to the Chamber, and I sincerely hope that, indeed, the Minister is listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Dave Thompson. Uh, President officer, I would like to congratulate Margaret Mitchell for bringing this important debate to the Chamber and also like her welcome the young stroke survivors to the Parliament today. I think key to improving uh, the quality of uh, health and indeed social care services is listening to the experience of those uh, who have had to use those services and clearly Margaret Mitchell has done that and drawn to the attention of the Minister many important issues that uh, need to be uh, addressed. But when I read the motion, I suppose I felt what I wanted to do was, was emphasise the importance uh, in general terms of uh, the voluntary health sector for health in particular, obviously in the context of today's uh, motion, the work of Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland. Obviously working across cardiovascular disease as well, but concentrating today obviously on their uh, stroke uh, services. And 
looking up some information, I, am, I was told that uh, there are 37 communication support services in South East Scotland alone. Obviously, I don't have direct uh, knowledge of Lanarkshire. And 1,333 people affected by speech and language difficulties after stroke benefited from their communication support services, which, of course, uh, are the centrepiece uh, of uh, the motion today. So, I, to be honest, I didn't know the scale of support that was given uh, to uh, stroke survivors by chest, heart, stroke in Scotland, and I certainly think we should pay tribute to their work. But, of course, it's not just in that particular area that they are active for stroke. They also have, uh, and again, I'm looking at my own area, uh, southeast of Scotland, seven stroke specialist um, uh, uh, services through stroke nurses. They've run a stroke training programme uh, for professionals in Lothian and I know elsewhere. And they've given research funding, for example, at the Western General Hospital. There's a research pro uh, project uh, supported by Chess Heart and Stroke uh, Scotland to better understand the relationship between different measures of blood pressure and different types of stroke. And over and above that, they have an advice line and information uh, and personal support grants to some uh, people who are survivors of stroke. So I think you know, the key thing I want to do to do is to pay uh, tribute to their work and looking to their strategy ahead. I know that they have plans over the next two or three years uh, to involve service users in the planning and design of services even more than they do at present and to further uh, develop uh, uh, training for specialist staff. So, and also, uh, and, uh, um, they of course have been very involved in the, in, in the FAST campaign in terms of recognize, the public recognising strokes and they've uh, uh, developed a campaign pack and sent, disseminated that through uh, the health service and clearly uh, the public recognising the symptoms of stroke is very important as well of course uh, as GP awareness as highlighted by, uh, by Margaret Mitchell. But uh, just in the last minute I think I would like to uh, um, give, I suppose, the more positive developments that have taken place, because Margaret Mitchell quite rightly highlighted all the actions that need to be taken still in relation to physiotherapy, speech and language therapy, uh, social care, and the blue badge issue is certainly one that I've come across recently as well. But I think we do need to recognise that we really over the years of this parliament, and in fact, starting uh, in, 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 in the three or four years before it, we have seen significant advances. For example, there was a 50% reduction in premature mortality from stroke between 1995 uh, and 2010. Over the last 10 years, the number of uh, 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 new cases um, of cerebrovascular disease is down by 21%. And the um, uh, stroke improvement um, plan, which, uh, which I read before the debate, told us that in the last year for which we have figures, there was a 10% improvement in delivering key elements of the stroke care bundle and lots of issues there about getting to a stroke unit, having a, getting an aspirin if it's appropriate, getting thrombolysis if it's appropriate and so on. So I think we should recognise that there has been very consistent progress uh, over the years of this parliament, particularly in relation to uh, hospital care for people who've had strokes. But I think it's quite right that Margaret Mitchell has emphasised what happens after people leave hospital and there are clearly many issues there that need to be addressed. Many, many thanks. Now call on Dave Thompson, after which we'll move to the closing speech from the Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I too would like to congratulate Margaret Mitchell on securing this debate and welcome the young stroke survivors uh, to the Parliament. It's a privilege to take part um, tonight, and uh, as I personally have benefit, benefited from heart surgery back in 2006 in the middle of my successful 2006-07 election campaign. Um, the repaired mitral valve, which uh, had done at that time and the single bypass are still fine. And my cardiologist in Inverness, the excellent Professor Steve Leslie, is very happy with me. I actually have a lot to thank the NHS for, including another major operation just 18 months ago on a bilateral subdural hematoma. Um, which could have left me much uh, worse than I am. Uh, I've recovered extremely well, and I'm very grateful for that. Of course, the NHS wouldn't function as well without bodies such as Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland. Uh, it's also a great privilege for me to be a vice convener of the Cross-Party Group on Heart Disease and Stroke, which does uh, much good work under the convenership of Dennis Robertson. Of course, chest, heart and stroke conditions are wide and varied, which means the information provided by Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland through its communication support services must be accurate and tailored to suit the individual 
cases. I have no doubt that we have all in some way uh, been touched by the great work that Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland do, even if we have not been fully aware of the tireless tasks that their volunteers and employees undertake behind the scenes. In that vein, I thought it would be useful to highlight just some of the campaigns that Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland are involved with right now. Firstly, there is uh, Voices Scotland. That is a national uh, network of people affected by chest, heart and stroke conditions who want to have their say. Through free workshops and ongoing support, people are provided with the knowledge, skills and confidence to work with the health and social care services in order to help plan new and better services. Then we have Think Fast and Save a Life, a campaign which has been mentioned already, which aims to raise awareness of stroke and acknowledges that with over 12,000 people in Scotland having a stroke every year, it is essential that folk recognise a stroke when it is occurring, so they are able to take the prompt action necessary. In addition, there is the Aphasia Alliance campaign, which highlights the fact that a third of the estimated 12,500 people who have a stroke in Scotland every year will be left with aphasia. Aphasia is a condition which affects the language skills of sufferers after they have experienced brain damage. It can affect speech, understanding and reading and writing. For those with breathing problems, we have the COPD awareness campaign, which is important because there are over 115,000 in Scotland with a diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. However, it is believed that many more people have COPD but are unaware of it. Many folk relate symptoms of COPD to smoking or ageing and tend not to report their symptoms to their doctors. Early diagnosis would hugely benefit these folk. Finally, there is the Parks Project, which is a person-focused range of activities for people with respiratory, uh, cardiac and stroke conditions. It's a collaborative project looking at different physical activity in a variety of community settings and whether this meets people's needs. Of course, all these campaigns involve hard-working health professionals who are also supported by Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland and many others who get involved. E-learning resources are also available and links to several specific Chest, Heart and Stroke related web resources, along with national health and social care resources being available. This is very helpful so that people can see at a glance what resources are available in their areas. For all of this, I thank Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland and wish uh, more power to their elbow. Without bodies and charities such as these, our health service would crumble, I have no doubt. So thank you very much indeed to all those who are involved. Many thanks. And now we move to the closing speech from Minister Maureen Mott. Minister, seven minutes or thereby. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I too would like to thank Margaret Mitchell for raising this motion and also congratulate Heart, Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland on their contribution to stroke care in Scotland over the last 20 years and also add my welcome to the Young Survivors Group in the gallery. Stroke remains the third biggest killer in Scotland and the leading cause of disability, which is why it has been a clinical priority for NHS Scotland since the mid-1990s. Over the years, the stroke community, of which CHSS is a key stakeholder, have worked together in making excellent progress to deliver the best possible health and social care to people who have had a stroke. However, we will always, survive, always strive to do more. And I am sorry to hear about of the situations that Margaret Mitchell described of people who have suffered strokes in North Lanarkshire. It is not acceptable. And I'm glad she has and will continue to take up robustly the issues with the Chief Executive of North Lanarkshire Council. Poor customer care is something that we shouldn't put up with and has to be challenged on every occasion. But it does mean that people have to learn that the best possible care uh, and um, service should be given uh, to those who need it. And I'm glad you mentioned adaptations. It was something when I was convener of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee and housing was part of the remit. I know how important uh, adaptations are in order that people can move, sometimes from a hospital setting, back to their homes um, as quickly as possible. Um, but we have done a lot, and this is reflected in the updated Stroke Improvement Plan published in August 2014, 
which sets out eight priority areas to ensure that in Scotland we continue to strive towards improved prevention, treatment and care of stroke. All those with an interest across all levels and roles have an important part to play. It is by working together, learning together and sharing best practice that we will deliver improvements. We must also continue to strengthen ways to actively engage with people affected by stroke and learn from them and identify the issues that are important to them. <clears throat> I'm proud to say that we supported Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland through collaborative working and our relationship with the charity extends beyond stroke care and we collaboratively work with them on improving heart disease and respiratory care too. CHSS Community Support Services is a good example of partnership working between CHSS and the NHS. This service offers an important bridge for stroke patients between speech and language therapy and independent activities in the community. It provides stroke survivors, young and old, with an opportunity to increase confidence and ability to communicate in a variety of social settings. And of course, this service is coordinated by someone who understands the needs of each individual and can be delivered on a one-to-one -one basis <clears throat> or in peer support groups. CHSS and North and NHS Lanarkshire also work in partnership to provide a number of other services, including stroke support nurses, training coordinators, and financial advice. So I think services are there, but perhaps they're not being used in the best way possible, or perhaps are not even known um, that they do exist. And as Malcolm Chisholm said, not every situation um, is as uh, Margaret Mitchell um, described. Since 2010, CHAS have run 11 successful FAST campaigns, raising awareness of stroke uh, symptoms, which we support. More recently, in 2013, we provided CHSS with funding to coordinate the FAST campaign with NHS boards and they've developed a toolkit for boards to use locally. This funding also supported the production of a short online video featuring actors from the popular Still Game uh, series to get the FAST message across. The FAST campaigns are aimed at both the general public and healthcare professionals including GPs. CHSS evaluation of these campaigns indicates, indicate that rec, uh, recognition of the FAST campaign message rose from 32 to 61 per cent and the proportion of patients or relatives who called NHS services for help within 30 minutes of the onset of the symptoms rose from 46 per cent to 62 per cent. I think that's really encouraging and it shows that we must keep this campaign going so that it reaches uh, even more people and I'm glad that Dave Thompson in his contribution highlighted the other campaigns that are run. We recognise the importance of supporting stroke survivors for improved well-being and quality of life. This is why the Stroke Improvement Plan sets out two priority areas that focus on rehabilitation and life after stroke. These priorities take a person-centred approach and ensure multidisciplinary stroke teams offer a range of self-management support. Stroke patients will have an acute therapy assessment, a stroke rehabilitation delivered by a stroke specialist based on the needs of the individual. Personalised and integrated services for adults who have had a stroke will be strengthened further with the implementation of the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Act 2013 and the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014. So in conclusion, Presiding Officer, we're committed to working in partnership with the voluntary sector to support new ways of delivering services. This is an ideal opportunity to publicly acknowledge the good work that has been advanced in partnership with CHSS across a range of long-term conditions. We're, con we're keen to continue working alongside charities like Ch uh, Chest Heart Support Scotland to make real improvements to the quality of life of people in Scotland. And finally, I'd like to thank David Clark, who has been Chief Executive of CHSS since 1994 and a member of the Scottish Government's National Advisory Committee for Stroke since inception 
over 10 years ago. I would like to wish him an enjoyable retirement when it comes in May. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you. And that concludes uh, this evening's business. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>